Okay, last but certainly not least, our final panel today, can, our, yeah, our final panel today includes two very, very special people. Neither really need an introduction, but I will just um, introduce them in my own way for our audience who will be watching this after the fact. So the first is Dr. Michael Levy, who we all know and love. He's a neuroimmunologist. He's a hero for the NMOSD and the MOGAD world. So thank you, Michael. Come on up. He's also the chairman of the Foundation's Medical Advisory Board, so we're really lucky to work with him. And the next guest is Ms. Christine Ha. Christine Ha was diagnosed with NMOSD. I consider her one of the OGs of NMOSD. She's been living with this for so long. But her, she is the prime example of how your disease and your diagnosis should never define you or limit you or consume you and stop you from doing the things that you want to do and living the life that you want to live and um, achieving your goals and dreaming big. Christine Ha was the first blind contestant on the very famous show Master Chef, and she won season three. She's now a uh, an entrepreneur. She has several restaurants. Come on over. She has several restaurants in Houston. So if you're ever in Houston, please check out her restaurants. She's a celebrity chef and author. And now, of course, you know, she's an NMOSD advocate. So today I have the honor and privilege of talking to these two wonderful people about self-advocacy, um, shared decision making, and why a healthy sort of reciprocal relationship with your caring physician is so critical to your patient journey with NMOSD, MOGAD, or any rare disease. So please join me in welcoming these fabulous people. Hi, Christine. Nice to be with you again. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, when did you get in? Uh, I got in, <clears throat> excuse me, yesterday evening, I think, from Houston. So I don't know how y'all live here. It's so cold. It's so cold. I feel so bad. <laughs> so in Houston, I think when I left, it was like the day before I left. I think it was almost 90 degrees already. So... Yeah, so this is a huge change, but I mean, I'm sure your spring and summers are much nicer than ours, but it is very cold here, so I'm probably, I'll am probably i probably be sniffling through this whole uh, panel, but glad to be here. And um, have you two met before? Yes. We have. Do you remember talking to me a long time ago? A long time ago. I think multiple times, I feel like. I know once we spoke in an elevator, <clears throat> I think another time we may have spoken on the phone. And once in Houston. Or Dallas. It might have been Dallas, I think. Yeah. We hung out together and you told me your whole story. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit of a reunion. And Dr. Ben Greenberg, who I believe is your, or was your doctor at one point, is your bestie, right? Ben Greenberg is my bestie. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> we grew up in Houston together. We went to med school together, did residency together. Oh, wow, med school. He yeah. wanted me to move back to Texas, but I just, I can't do it. It's just too hot. <laughs> The opposite problem of here. Anyway, um, Christine, I know your story so well, but for the audience who maybe has never heard it or um, doesn't really know as much, can you talk to us about, let's go way, way, way back when you first experienced symptoms and you know your di diagnosis journey. Can you share a bit about that? Sure. Um, I think I want to do this whole panel with this unicorn in my lap. Yes. So this is very uh, strange, but you know, I'm all I'm the queen of awkwardness. So let's have at it. So um, I will tell you about a, a little bit about my background in case you don't know. I'm sure many of you have heard about my background before. But um, like Samira said, I'm probably one of the OG people with NMO when I was diagnosed back in the early 2000s. It was uh, called Devix syndrome or Devix disease then. Uh, very rare and still rare uh, neuroimmunologic condition. Um, I didn't know anyone with NMO. Uh, I remember asking even my doctors, neurologists then were, were barely aware about what NMO was. I did some research online and back then I remember only two places I found anything to do with NMO research. One was uh, UCSF in San Francisco and the other was in the UK. So I do remember contacting both 
um, hospitals and asking about DEVICs. And they said, well, you know, you live far away, so you're not really qualified for any of our treatment um, research programs, but we can connect you with um, some patients if they're willing. And so I did meet two patients through uh, these connections, and I connected online and asked them what their story was like. But basically, it was everyone's journey was different. Uh, mine started off with initially losing vision in one of my eyes when I was in college. Uh, of course, I, I originally thought it was my contact lens. And so uh, I think I'm sure many of you have gone through that before, thinking it was an eye problem. Uh, it wasn't a contact lens. I went to the optometrist. They said it was something neurological. So I was sent to a neuro-ophthalmologist. And then um, the usual tests, and they couldn't pinpoint MS, even though they thought it would be MS. And then it wasn't until a couple years later when I experienced uh, numbness in one of my legs that they decided, okay, by default, we'll uh, diagnose you with MS because you've had two symptoms that point to MS at two different points in time on two different parts of your body. So by default, let's say you have MS. So I was put on MS therapies, uh, the daily injections, and despite being put on this MS treatment, uh, several times a year I would continue to get attacks, and I had a very serious attack. I remember in 2002 where uh, over a course of a couple days, everything from my neck down went completely paralyzed. So I was unable to, uh, I had, I suffered from incontinence, like I couldn't relieve my bladder, uh, I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't walk, move my feet, I couldn't sit up by myself. Uh, the only thing that really worked was neck and above. So I remember feeling very scared, um, wondering if I would be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, if I could even get in a wheelchair, because I was pretty much bedridden. And it took actually nine months of a lot of physical therapy, occupational therapy, and medication to help me fully recover from the paralysis. But unfortunately, over the years, I got a lot of optic neuritis. So both of my optic nerves atrophied over time, and that's how I gradually lost my vision. Um, so that's really my story with NMO back then, is no one I knew was going through this. So it was very lonely and isolating. And so Today, I'm, I feel really grateful that there are foundations like this and advocacy organizations and, and a lot more resources than when I was going through this in the 2000s um, because I'm sure it's a very isolating and lonely experience. You have to share the story of how you approached Dr. Greenberg at that conference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I consider myself an educated patient. And so it was frustrating that I felt like at that time I had no answers from any of the doctors I was seeing. Uh, I attended a rare disease conference in Dallas and Dr. Greenberg, who's still my neurologist today, uh, I, he spoke on a, a panel. And then afterwards, I was like, I told, I told my husband, John, and I was like, I have to meet this doctor. And if he doesn't become my neurologist, because the neurologist I had in Houston didn't really know about NMO. I was like, he needs to find me someone who does, and I'd be willing to fly to Dallas or the Mayo Clinic in Arizona or, or, or what have you just to have an NMO specialist know or understand where I'm coming from. So I basically accosted him when he was leaving the stage and coming out, and I went up to him, and I was like, Dr. Greenberg, I know you don't know me, but my name is Christine Ha, and I'm dealing with this, 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 and please, like, if your clinic can't see me and you can't see me, like, please recommend me someone who can, and he, I don't know, he was generous and he said, well, you know, contact my clinic, we'll get you in. Um, and that's how I became his patient. And this was also in the mid 2000s. So I've been his patient for 20, almost 20 years. And an incredible example of how self-advocacy can really help you in your journey. Like now you have this incredible doctor who you've been with for more than two decades. So that's wonderful. I love that story. Dr. Levy, when you hear stories like Christine's, um, how does it help you sort of think about approaching, you know, care and diagnosis and all of that? Does it change anything for you? Yeah, when I was a resident at Johns Hopkins in 2004, we had a lot of patients like Christine who came into the hospital. They carried a di diagnosis of MS. They were using injectables, and they were getting worse and worse and worse, and they would say, Dr. Levy, I've been doing everything my doctor told me to do, and I'm just getting worse and worse. And when the blood test became available in 2005, it was like a game changer. It was like a light 
shown on all of our patients saying, okay, you actually don't have MS. It looks like MS, but it's not. And we established a new clinic and started bringing people over. And I heard so many stories like yours. And then people started coming together in patient days and um, eventually clinical trials. And now, 20 years later, we have three FDA-approved drugs. So it goes from you know, nothing to, to zero to 60 in, in a very short time. Yes. Another question for you, Dr. Levy. So everyone's NMO has become NMOSD uh, quite recently, right? In the last 20, 10 years, it changed um, to make it NMO spectrum disorder because everybody has such a different experience. It's truly a spectrum. So just for um, our audience who is coming into the conversation and missed the earlier sessions, what are some common symptoms and characteristics that you see in NMO patients, especially the more recently diagnosed ones? Well, fortunately, it doesn't need to be optic neuritis, blindness, paralysis, bladder dysfunction before you get to our attention. That doesn't happen that much anymore. Honestly, people come in with their first attack. The doctors are clever enough to send the aquaporin for antibody, MOG antibody, um, or if you're even if you're seronegative, it might take a little longer, but eventually you come to our attention and we can make the diagnosis. And we established a new name, the spectrum disorder, so you don't have to meet all of the extensive criteria. You could have just a few, but if you have the antibody, we can start treating you. And that's really changed everything. Now we treat aggressively. Nobody leaves my clinic with an aquaporin 4 antibody without any treatment. Like, I make you decide then and there, you got to go on something because this is too risky to not treat. That's brilliant. Um, Christine, I love to talk to you in food language. Um, first of all, what do you love to make? What's your favorite thing to make? Uh, that could be a loaded question, but I'll answer something that I, so I'm around food a lot. Yeah. So at home, I do a lot of research and development for our uh, restaurants. But at the end of the day, if it's been a long day of work, for some reason, I really crave obviously something simple to make and something just easy to digest. So oftentimes I do have like steamed brown jasmine rice and I'll just scramble up a couple of eggs and I eat it with a uh, homemade kimchi that my mother-in-law made for us. So that's kind of like something I will just uh, eat and I season it with a little bit of like Maggie sauce or mm. fish sauce or something. So that's like very, just very simple comfort food and just really quick to make. Love it. Okay, we'll go back to the, the programmed conversation. But um, Christine, you must, you sit in such an interesting position because you were misdiagnosed you were, you know, around when nobody was really talking about NMO. And then all of a sudden, everybody's talking about NMO. And then you got correctly diagnosed. And now you're seeing all of these FDA-approved therapies and all the advocacy. I mean, NMO really is everywhere now in terms of neuroscience. You hear it all the time. In your opinion, having experienced the highs and lows of every aspect of the disease yourself, to newly diagnosed people and physicians, what would you say is the perfect recipe for like a successful sort of patient story with NMOSD, MOGAD, or rare disease? What ingredients lead to that? I think first and foremost, be as educated of a, as a patient as you can. Um, I think that's very important because your treatment plan and how your health care goes really is determined by you as the patient. Um, yes, you need a lot of help from your doctors, your nurses, your care team, your caregivers, but you're the one living in that body and you have to live with your disease every day and you know how those symptoms are. And everyone's experience is different, though we all can be considered same and under this umbrella disease, but I think it's really important to be communicative with your doctor and the, your, your healthcare team. Uh, you know, notice all of your symptoms, like at the beginning, and even to this day, I log any time I have an NMO symptom. I've fortunately been attack free for over 15 years since I've been put on the right therapy for me, but I still, anytime I feel a symptom or every time I have 
um, another treatment or whatever, I do log it. So I have a log of everything that I've gone through health-wise and through with my NMOSD that dates all the way back to 2001 when I had my, uh, you know, or I'm sorry, 1999 when I had my first attack. Um, so I think it's important to note these things so that when you come to your doctor, you have things written down, you have your list of questions, uh, and then you talk through these things with your your doctor because it is a two-way street. Um, I used to place so much pressure on my doctors thinking that they were geniuses and gods and know everything, which I'm sorry, Dr. Levy, if you totally are like a genius, like, you know. No uh, offense. Totally fine. But I also realized that they're humans too, and they all they don't know everything all the time. Um, they're definitely professionals and experts, and I lean on them a lot to give me advice, but you too are your own expert living in your own personal body. So I think it's very important to steer that ship and be it your own best advocate as an educated patient and go to your doctor with your list of questions that you want answered, how you're feeling, these things should be documented, all of these things, I think. So that helps your care team give you the best care possible. That's awesome. Sorry, back to food for a second, but it does sort of tie into what we're talking about. When did your relationship with cooking start? Um, I started cooking coincidentally around the same time I started losing my vision. So this was in college uh, after I moved out of the dorms after my freshman year. I realized I had to, I didn't know how to cook at all. So I grew up spoiled by my mom's cooking, but she died when I was 14 and never taught me how to cook. So when I was in college, I missed her cooking. And my parents were both Vietnamese refugees, so my mom cooked a lot of uh, simple Vietnamese home cooking, and I missed the foods I grew up eating. So I decided to teach myself in my second year when I moved out of the dorms and didn't have dorm food to rely on, and I figured I had to teach myself how to cook so I could live. And then I bought a couple cookbooks. I had vision then, so I was reading the recipes and just pretty much having at it in the kitchen, not really knowing what I was doing at all. So I botched a lot of dishes at the beginning, but I realized after cooking my first successful dish that my friends ate and actually complimented me on, I realized that there was something really uh, fulfilling about cooking and serving other people. I think my my MO in life is to serve other people and make other people happy. Uh, so for me, food is about sharing myself and, and nourishing other people. So. I just kept uh, learning everything I could about ingredients and cooking techniques, and uh, it was simultaneously around this time when I experienced my first bout of optic neuritis. So every time I lost more vision, I would have to teach myself again how to use a knife with less and less sight, how to deal with fire with uh, less and less vision. But I'm very independent and determined to still be independent in spite of losing my vision and, and then being diagnosed with NMO. So I just kept teaching myself how to cook food, um, even though I was losing my vision, and then um, the rest is kind of history. Wow, that's so inspiring. I, loved, I love your story, I really. And it always makes me so hungry, so I'll have to eat. I know, I think it's almost dinner time for you also, everyone's starting to But so food is definitely your love language then, right? Yeah. I love that, that's so sweet. Um, but it's a nice segue into my next question. So you're clearly very bright um, and an autodidact, it sounds like. You just said yourself, you're very independent. So you did a lot of your own research, a lot of you know self-advocating, which is what we're talking about now. So to other patients out there, like, sorry, in rare disease, I feel, just from my experience, your experience, and hearing everybody else's, you almost have to be an autodidact and glean as much information as you can from you know, credible resources so that you know how to best advocate for yourself. So in the spirit of self-advocacy and learning things on your own and you know, referencing this resource or that resource, what would you say is the best sort of pathway to learning all of these things? Like what resources were helpful to you so that you could best advocate for yourself? Well, I wish I had this then, but I would say right now a really good resource is the website nmosdwontstopme.com that has a lot of resources and you can find other people's stories of patients living with NMO. Uh, I wish that I had something like that back then, yeah. um, but you know there are these foundations just like the Samara Foundation that have are also very good resources in terms of 
treatments out there, connecting with other patients, for caregivers to connect with other caregivers, and I think just learning uh, stories so that I think the most important thing is like also just tying in with mental health is like when you feel uh, very isolated and alone, when you don't know anyone else who understands what you're going through, that can take a big toll mentally. And mental health can affect your physical health so much as well. So I think to be able to just find someone else to understand your story uh, or find a healthcare team that are, um, can help you figure out what's going on with your symptoms or find a right treatment plan for you, I would say uh, go online and find these uh, organizations or go to nmosdwonstopme.com and find uh, more resources there as well that you can connect with other organizations there as well. Absolutely. Dr. Levy, um, you see so many patients, NMOSD and MOGAD here, when you were at Hopkins, when you were at Texas. From your perspective, what's important for a clinician to know and sort of do when it comes to patient care so that the patients feel comfortable and that they're honest with you and that they share things with you? Um, I think treating them like a family member and understanding that that they're going th through a life-changing event. They're not just a client, they're a human being, and trying to understand what their priorities are. Sometimes I spend 20 minutes talking about things that are important to me, and then I'll say, well, what questions do you have? And they have just completely different questions, and um, it's more important to address questions that they have rather than the things that are in my mind. So to all the clinicians out there, I would say, just ask your patients, what's important to you? What can we talk about? What, what can we fix today? I think that would be my primary advice. And when patients are meeting you for the first time, assuming it's early on in their diagnosis, what do you hear sort of scares them the most about their diagnoses? And what do you provide to sort of help alleviate those concerns? I think it's the uncertainty. I mean, you all can tell me, but the fear of a relapse, the fear of not being able to contact your doctors, the fear of the emergency room doctors not taking you seriously, the you know, just the uncertainty of when it could happen, where it could happen, people asking me if they can travel, what if an attack occurs wherever, wherever they're going, what do they do? I hear that a lot, and I, I think these days we have technology, we have cell phones, even just giving patients my cell phone number, hardly anyone calls me, but I give it out as often as I can, and, um, and I think it just gives people reassurance to know that we're all connected, something happens, we're there, and we can just give advice basically all around the world now. So the NMOSD Won't Stop Me's newest themed campaign is about gratitude, as we all know, and um, gratitude towards those who have supported us throughout our journeys. And oftentimes, these are our spouses, our parents, our children, our care partners. And Christine, I know your husband plays a huge role in your life. So like, how different do you think your experience would have been if you didn't have someone like him by your side? Uh, definitely feel it would feel lonelier. I mean, he doesn't know exactly what it's like to be me, but he met me when uh, kind of when I was starting to lose my vision. So I had more vision than I I did now. And uh, then we started dating. And of course, his his concern was also like getting married. Like this is um, you know, am I in this in in for the in the long haul with this person? And can I deal with this? And um, he took that leap of faith, and I think without him, um, I mean, he he's not, I, I'm the kind of person that be, he respects my independence, so I don't want someone to always, like, be super nurturing or baby me because I'm, I like my independence, and I want to feel, okay, I can do this on my own, but at the same time, like, sometimes I do push myself too hard, and I do need someone to catch me if I fall, sometimes quite literally, so I think he is he really knows how to gauge what I need and when I need it. And I think that's important. That does take time. I mean, now I think we've, we're coming on 14 years of marriage. Wow. So, you know, he, and then we met in like 2008, seven, 2000. So it was shortly after I started it, like, well, that shortly after I was diagnosed with NMOSD. But um, I mean, not just my husband, but like, his family, my family, my friends, my doctor, my the nurses, everyone plays such a 
significant role, I think, in my well-being. So I'm really thankful for, even before I knew John, like my best friends who spent time with me when I was paralyzed in the hospital or like would come and feed me, keep me company, just they would take time off of work and just work from my house just so I had someone there to like help me to the restroom. I think all of these roles play such a significant part in feeling like, okay, this this really sucks what I'm going through, but there are people around me that are trying their best to help. And if I accept their love and their help, then I can eventually literally put one foot in front of the other and figure out what the path will be with this new way of life. That's beautiful. As a hyper-independent person myself, I know how difficult it is to let people help and all the things, but when you receive it, actually, sometimes it's kind of nice, so you get it. Um, Dr. Levy, on the topic of care partners, how do you include them in decision-making for the patient? Um, I usually, obviously, start with the patient, and I find that um, I try to gauge the relationship, and if the spouse jumps in and offers to provide more information or to take responsibility, then I'll take them up on it as long as it's, it works for the couple. Um, I do find that people who have care partners have it a little bit easier have, relying on someone who's there to help you. Obviously, um, it, it really does help. And it, it doesn't have to be like a husband or lover. It could be kids. It could be parents. It could be cousins, friends, neighbors. I even had one guy brought in by three neighbors and all three of them are there and really helping him out. And so it doesn't matter who it is as long as they're you know, really in to help you. Yeah. And um, what advice would you give to someone, whether they're newly diagnosed or they have a new doctor and they're starting a relationship, a new relationship with a doctor? Christine, we'll start with you. Um, so the question is, how, what's what the advice, advice for... Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it goes back to what I had previously um, said where the the path to diagnosis and treatment is really about it's not just what the 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 doctor says but also you as the patient so um, I think it's important to be completely honest um, I think a lot of times we aren't ready to share some things um, with our doctors or with our caregivers but I think it's important People can only help you if you're willing to be helped. So I think it's also important to come to the table uh, in complete honesty. Um, be very vulnerable in, in what your experience is, both about your physical struggles with NMOSD, but also your mental uh, and emotional struggles, because we all know that living with this disease is not easy. So um, I think it's important to just be honest with yourself as well, and then bring that honesty and vulnerability to the table with your doctor. Absolutely. Dr. Levy? I would say a lot of times there are questions that um, have no wrong answer. And so what I, what I try to do is bring the patient into the conversation. You tell me what your priorities are, and then we come up with a treatment plan together, and you buy into it. Because I feel like if you're buying into it, you're going to stick with it, and you're going to be much more compliant than if I just say, you got to do this, and you got to eat that. I don't think most people want to hear it that way. But it does require you to do your research, to think about things, and then to make a decision with us. Right. Christine, I know you're partnering with Amgen for NMO Awareness Month for another year. And you know we established uh, this year's theme is really about gratitude. You mentioned your husband has been such a pillar of support for you. Who else are you thanking? Uh, one of my best friends, uh, Karen, whom uh, we became friends in college. So by now, it's been... I'm totally going to date myself, but it's been 20-something uh, years. Uh, but she, I remember, she was, uh, we were both business majors in college. And then after college was when I started going through more of these health issues. And that's when I had to leave work uh, because I was dealing with the vision loss and the paralysis and the, the long time that it took me to get diagnosed. But Karen was the one that would take me to the doctor she would get my mail, read my mail for me, pick up my prescriptions, take me to the library to borrow audiobooks to listen to, to pass the time. She would uh, just come over and hang out. I think just to sit next to me, listen to the television, do whatever. So I will always think about Karen um, because she was there for me even before I'd met John. 
And she actually left her corporate job and became a nurse because of my story. So um, she's still one of my best friends to this day. Um, and we were both bridesmaids in each other's weddings. So I'm very grateful for Karen. And she's someone I'll always uh, think about when I think about my whole journey with NMOSC. Oh, yay, Karen. Love friends like that. Dr. Levy, who are you grateful for in terms of your NMOSD and MOGAD life? I am most grateful to my team. Yeah. I honestly, <laughs> I could not do all of this work without them. Um, I, I try to send them uh, my appreciation any chance I get um, because it's this is a team effort. It's my team, it's also all the teams in Dallas and Mayo and California and everywhere else. No one works in a silo anymore. You have to work together. It's the only way to make progress. Love that. Okay, so just a reminder, there are the thank you card QR codes on your tables. Um, there's also a booth out there if you wanna film a video for someone you're grateful to and Josh and Christine will help you get it out to the right people. But before we open up the floor for Q&A, we do have a very short video to share with you. Thank you, Frank, or babe as I call you. I wanna say thanks so much for the last three years, hanging with me, my ride or die, through everything that I've been through. I just want to say, Karen, that I really appreciate you and I hope you know that. Thank you everyone, my doctors, nurses, therapists who believed me and believed in me and didn't give up on me during a really difficult time. To Ben, I would say, you are the embodiment of unconditional love and you are selfless day after day to my family my friends my colleagues my supervisors my mentors acquaintances and anyone who has shown me support over the last 10 years of living with nmo thank you from the bottom of my heart So we'd love for you to also record these videos. And I love that it says NMOSD won't stop us because it's true. When you get diagnosed with a rare disease, it affects everyone in your life and your family. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Amgen, for that. OK, so now we have time for questions and answers. Um, People are shy, so I'll just say it. it. You know, if you have questions directly for Christine, you can say it's for Christine, or if it's just for Dr. Levy, you can say that. We can ask about advocacy, shared decision making, diagnostic journey, Christine's incredible cooking career. What's it like being on Master Chef? I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? They are very tired. We've been here since 11 a.m., so that, that may be why. <laughs> Question for Christine. So uh, amazing journey you've had. I, I'm just curious, as you lost your vision, you were also learning to cook and you became such a great chef, you know, cookbooks, shows, Gordon Ramsay, et cetera. Um, did, did losing your vision somehow make you a better cook? I, I do get that question a lot. I, I would say I'm probably not as good as plating if I had I been able to see. But I, I do think that losing one uh, sense has forced me to hone in on my other senses. So when I do taste food or smell food, it's much more nuanced than I think if I were to still have my vision. Um, so I think in that way, I pay much more attention to uh, when I make a dish and then compose it all together and have a bite is this a good temperature, a mix of textures, flavors? I think because of that, it has made me in some ways a, a better cook. And it's definitely, it definitely made me a better competitor on MasterChef. And I'll tell you why. It's because when I couldn't see what anyone else was doing, I didn't really care what anyone else was doing. So I told myself, I'm just going to cook better today than I did yesterday in the MasterChef kitchen. And I'm not going to worry about what anyone else is doing and not second guess 
what I decided to cook because so-and-so next to me is making something with better ingredients. And so I think I was less distracted by what other people were doing. So I started realizing like I'm just competing against myself. And as long as I learned something from a previous challenge and did better uh, today, then that's all I could ask for. So I think that helped me focus much more in the competition. And I do think that is plays a part of um, helping me succeed on the competition. Christine, what's your sign? When were you born? Uh, my month sign, I'm a Taurus. My year sign, I'm a goat. Ooh, you are a goat. Greatest of all time. <laughs> I think we have a question over there. Hi, Marcelo. So a question for Christine. And um, thanks for, for bringing so much um, optimism and, and um, just really a different look into um, the world of visual disability and how much you, you, you've accomplished. The question is related to, you know, stress, a stressful situations. Of course, the show is very stressful, right? Even as a, a spectator here, the audience is, just can feel uh, the pressure, but also as an entrepreneur and um, uh, someone who owns and, and manages restaurants, uh, it's, a, it's a business of stress. And, but just following you on social media, it, it just feels like you have time for yourself or you meditate or, or mindfulness. Where do you find that balance to allow you um, is a big smile and, and bring so, the optimism and, and uh, how to move forward? Sure. Um, I think that's a great question. I think I'll, you're right. I am very busy, and I will say that life can be very stressful for me. I think one, when I realized that I was starting to burn out, I went to therapy. Uh, so I feel like mental health is very important. Sometimes you need a, a professional that's a third party, like not your spouse, not your best friend, not your staff, um, someone to talk to and be completely honest and have them equip you with skills to change the way you think about things. So I think that's one thing that's really important. Um, two is I'm, I mentioned I'm very independent and I'm very stubborn and it was very hard for me to let go of a lot of uh, things in my life to trust other people. But I really feel like my vision was taken from me and it forced me to tr uh, depend on other people, whether it's having someone else drive me somewhere, uh, depending on my management team at my restaurants to manage the business correctly so I could travel here today uh, to do something like this. It's hard to trust other people, but I was forced to in some ways, and I'm thankful for that. Um, so it's been a, a lifetime of learning to let go of things and not knowing that not everything will always be, in my eyes, perfect. But if I'm 80% happy with the result, then that's what I can ask for, and I'm grateful for that. So grateful for people around me to help support me in my vocation or in my life. Um, and I think it's also, and this last part comes with maturity, I think is realizing that life is short and your people, you can't control what other people do, but you can learn to control how you react and how you feel about it. And that does take time. But also I think learning that gratitude is important, whether it's keeping a gratitude journal or every day just saying something to yourself in the mirror about why you know, you're proud of yourself or why you're grateful for something. And it's really the small things in life. Like I've, I've learned that, and I've posted this on my social media before, like when I was younger, I used to think like, oh, the amazing things in life or the, what makes me happy is like graduating from school or winning MasterChef or finishing this cookbook that I wrote. But now it's like, no, there are very small things every day that happened to us that we should be grateful for. So for me, it's like, a, a, it's funny, it's ironic, but a day of nice weather. <laughs> Not today. Um, I'm sure for today, for many people, but for me, it's cold. But, you know, being able to walk outside with my dog, spending five minutes with my husband and my dog, you know, just catching up in a day, uh, or having um, a really good cocktail or glass of wine or really good mocktail or having a really good bite of food or catching up with an old friend or just even petting my dog or anything like very small things like being able to get up and I, I still to this day think about when I was completely paralyzed from the neck down and how I was so like 
dependent on other people. And to this day, sometimes when I pour myself a glass of water and hold it up to my mouth and drink it, I'm thankful. Like I'm able to do that today, which I couldn't do decades ago for a, peri a long period of time. So I think trying to remember those small joys in life and being grateful for those things, I think is really important for your mental wellness. And I think personally, that's how I stay optimistic. What kind of dog do you have? I have a Cairn Terrier mutt that we adopted right before the pandemic. And he's the best dog. And I named him George after George Costanza on Seinfeld, my favorite character of my favorite sitcom. Love it. Oh, we have a question right here. OK, Christine, I, I absolutely love everything that you've said and the positivity that you've had. And you truly have made lemonade from those lemons. And everything that you just talked about, being paralyzed and now not being paralyzed, the things that you can do that you weren't able to do before. And it's just such a blessing to hear those things come from you, letting people know that you know, you are not NMO, you are not your disease, and there are things that you can do to live a healthier life. And I really didn't have a question, but I wanted to just tell you, you know, I've been following you for, for years, but I, I wanted to tell you how grateful that I am to hear things from you that can make my day. Mm. So I just thank you for telling your story. Oh, that's very sweet. I think we have another question over here. What's your name? Uh, good evening. My name is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Samaria. Um, my question is actually for Dr. Levy, but first I want to say uh, thank you for being my mom's doctor, and thank you for giving out your cell phone because uh, that really does show incredible care and accessibility, and that's really unusual. I don't have an MO, but I'm a cancer survivor, and I know that with all my doctors, I never had anybody's cell phone. <laughs> so um, my question really has to do with, um, because you are so, so patient-focused and so accessible, I guess my, my question really is, are there things that we as patients can be doing, or as the community that, is, that you're serving, that also serves you and helps you and makes your life sustainable? Because... I'm sure you have a lot of things pulling on you. You have a lot of patients that you care deeply for. And it'd be great if there are things that we can do to make your life easier as well. That's Actually, such a good yes. question. There is. And um, I, I think groups like this and on Facebook where people can talk to each other and learn from shared experiences is probably the, the best way um, that I, I, you could help me. On Facebook, we started a group in 2013 for NMO. And I would try to field all these questions. And I was up late at night answering feverishly. And then something happened. And enough people started answering other people's questions that I didn't have to answer them. And it grew. And I, I haven't logged in in weeks to Facebook. And um, I hope I'm not missing anything. Gabrielle is supposed to be monitoring for us. But um, you know, the, I think the having that inertia of um, people helping other people is really the best way to, to do this. We have time for one more question. Hi, Marion. So I actually don't have a question. It's more of a comment um, similar to uh, Dr. Peppers. But I just wanted to say to Christine, I am just so inspired by your story. You know, many times people think when, you know, we receive a diagnosis like NMO that our life, like things are ending. Um, but in reality, in a new way, you know, our life is just beginning. And so... I just want to encourage you to continue to be the person that you are, you know, sharing your story. Um, you know, it's a testament to, you know, we can choose to look at things through a new lens, right? And we can make a decision that when we receive this diagnosis, we get to decide how the journey begins, and those dreams and goals and aspirations that we once had prior to NMO, we can still have those dreams and aspirations. We can still accomplish things. And we can actually become a better version of ourselves. 
So I just thank you for the traveling that you, uh, you know, make time to budget into this busy schedule that you have for sharing on social media. And, um, you know, just I know, you know, for you to share your story of, you know, at the age of 14, you know, you know, losing your mom. You know, I know that there is an angel that is with you daily that um, I, I, I can only imagine just how proud your mom would be um, to see, you know, the person that you have become. So I just want to share that with you as, you know, a part of, you know, probably what she would say if she was still here. So we are just all grateful to have you in this community. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for those kind words. Marion just ran her first marathon. Yeah. <laughs> We're so proud of her. Anyway, wow, I'm tearing up here too. <laughs> um, thank you everyone so much for joining. Uh, I told myself I wasn't going to cry today. Marion, this is your fault. But um, what a beautiful coming together of people today. This is... Uh, this was a labor of love, blood, sweat, and tears went into today. But seeing everyone, whether you're on stage or off stage, seeing how you, you've you received today and each other and the information, it uh, really keeps me motivated um, to keep doing this work and our team here too. So once again, thank you so much for joining us, for being part of this incredible day, making memories, inspiring each other. Thank you to the doctors who have spent their Saturdays with us, coming from all over, um, to the patients, you know, to the care partners. We're so, so grateful. And I hope that together we can continue to illuminate the darkness of uh, our diseases. So thank you once again. Thank you, Christina. I'm sorry it's so cold. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm really grateful to be here. So um, I, I just want to leave with the last message, too, is like, thank you for giving me these encouraging words. I think I was brought up, like, to not be very open about myself. And I remember when I first started losing my vision, I was, like, ashamed and I would hide it. And then I was suddenly on MasterChef and then... It was like a Band-Aid that got ripped off. Suddenly the whole world knew I was blind and it was in some ways liberating. And so now I'm a huge advocate of being uh, not quiet about your diagnosis, about your life, about who you are as a person. Um, so I think we're all built as different individuals and that's what makes this world beautiful is that we're all different and our NMO journeys are also different. Our life journeys are different, our career paths. But the fact that I think we try to connect with one and another through events like this, through food, whatever it may be, like keep on trekking on and sharing your story because your story too is, is very special. So um, just thank you for having us here today. <laughs> Great. Thank you all again, really appreciate. If you need my phone number, I got it up here. And again, thank you all for coming. Just, uh, uh, a safe ride home. I know some people came from different states and and some people come from different suburbs of Boston and just be inspired by this day as I am. I think all of you learned something new and have different ideas on how to uh, collaborate, how to move this field forward and to help each other. But thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you.